Okay, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Welcome back to a basic plant science lecture. Uh, let me go ahead and pull up today's slides. This is the fourth already. Whoa, halfway through. When we finish this, we'll be halfway through the summer course. Moves very fast. Uh, let me share my screen. Great. I think you guys should be able to see that. Let me just double check. I'm always so nervous. <laughs> yes. Yes, share. Yes, big. Okay. <laughs> and I'll make this a little bigger too. There we go. Sweet. All right. So lecture number four. Last time we did the leaf and the root. We cover a bunch of their functions, their in external and internal forms, dicot leaf and monocot leaf versus our dicot leaf and monocot leaf, dicot root and monocot root, uh, different types of root systems, and then variation and adaptation on the leaf and the root. Today, we're finally into flowers and fruit and seeds. Yay, look, flowers. I even brought flowers just so we could have it for, <laughs> for our lecture today. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about the structure of flowers, the differences between monocot and dicot flowers and seeds, uh, and then a summary of the differences between monocots and dicots that we've covered so far. Um, different kinds of fruits, different ways that fruits and seeds are dispersed, and then lastly, seed structure and germination. And I, I think this will be a slightly shorter class than the last one, so I'm going to do my best to have, make that be so. All right, so let's first talk flowers. So what is a flower? A flower is a specialized shoot system, and the leaves of that shoot system are modified for reproduction. So remember, when we talked about the shoot system, you have the stem, the leaves, and the flowers. And so the flowers are the part of the shoot system where sexual reproductive structures are going to be located. There are male structures that are called stamens and there are female structures that are called pistil. Here is a representative flower showing you the parts. So there's a pistil, a, there's stamens, and then there's petals, which you're probably the most familiar with, and something called sepals. So the parts of the pistil are the stigma, style, and ovary. The parts of the stamen are the anther and the filament. So there's many, usually many anthers and many filaments for the stamens. And then it all depends on the species of plant, but um, the petals and sepals. Sepals are the little green leafy looking things at the bottom of the flower. So I just mentioned these four things, right? Pistol, stamens, petals, and sepals. And so in flowers, the way that those are a, arranged are in what's called worlds, worlds, which means circles, which means circles. And so if you look here on the left, you see a diagram of the flower where um, the green things are those sepals and the blue things are the petals. And then the yellow things are the stamens and the central thing is the pistil. And so the, don't worry, this. In this slide, it says carpels instead of pistil. It's the same thing, just pretend it says pistil uh, on the world floor. But if you see what, what's going on here is, and I'll do this, if you do a cross section through this flower and then look at it under the microscope, you'll see that the different parts of the flower are arranged in these circles. So the outermost circle is that of the sepals or the green things. Second circle, is the petals or the blue things. Next is the stamens. And then the last whorl or circle is the pistil. Okay. So that's how flowers are organized. So let's talk about parts of the pistil. So the pistil is made up of the stigma, the style, and the ovary. And so I'll switch colors here to yellow. Um, so this, I'm gonna try to call, I'm gonna try to draw around it. This whole thing right there in the middle is the pistil. 
Here is the tip of the pistol, which is the stigma. And the stigma's job is to catch pollen. Next, you have this long thing that holds the stigma. And that long thing is called a style. And its job is to hold the stigma out of the flower so that the stigma can receive pollen. And lastly, the ovary, which is at the base of the pistil. And the ovary holds one or more ovules. So those are the parts of the pistil, um, which is the female reproductive part. Now we'll talk stamens. So stamens, on this flower that we see here, which is a lily, there's lots of different stamens. Um, and each of those has a anther and a filament. So here is one anther. And the anther, the anther's job is to produce pollen. So that's gonna be where pollen is made, which will ultimately get brought to the stigma. And I always say sticky stigma because the sticky stigma catches the pollen right on the previous slide. Uh, and then similar to the style of the stigma, you have this filament of the anther and the filament's job is just to hold the anther out of the flower so that the pollen that the anther makes can um, be taken by whatever mechanism, the wind or an animal or something like that to get brought to the stigma. Um, the petals, which like I said, you guys are probably the most familiar with, are their job is to attract pollinators. So on this lily, the petals and the sepals look similar on this lily, uh, but here is a petal, here is another petal, and then there's a third petal over here that you can't really see. And when you talk about all the petals together uh, of one flower, you can call it a corolla, not like a, not like a corolla, which I have, <laughs> uh, but like a corolla, which means a crown, which means a crown. Um, so those are the petals. And then, like I said, on this lily, the sepals and petals look very similar, but the sepals job is basically when you buy, think of, um, if you've ever bought, an, bought an, if you've ever bought a rose to give to give as a gift to somebody, then you know that at the bottom of the rose, there's those like little green leaves. Those are the sepals. Sometimes on certain plants, the, the sepals aren't green when they're mature. Like for example, in this lily, uh, but the sepals job, if you look here on this, this is a flower that has not opened yet. We can see the sepals very clearly uh, because they're still green. So those green things are the sepals and they're holding the rest of the flower inside because it hasn't opened yet. But on the one on the left here, the sepals have already opened, but notice that they're under the petals, right? Because they're the lowermost whorl. Remember the whorls are sepals, petals, stamens, and then pistil in the middle. Um, and all the sepals together, you can call a calyx. So all the flower petals together are corolla, all the sepals of a flower together are called a calyx. This is a diagram from your book, just kind of puts it in a different way to look at it. Um, it's a lot easier on this diagram, for example, to see the ovary of the pistil, right? Um, and here's the style and here is the sticky stigma, right? And you can see there's an ovule, in this case, one ovule inside of the ovary. Yes, and also on this one, it's nice because the sepals, which are shown here in green are actually green, which is what they usually are when we think of a flower, right? And those are gonna be the things that protect the flower before it opens. Okay. Um, so you can have different, different plants have different ways that flowers are arranged depending on the plant. So I already mentioned a rose. So some plants have solitary flowers or born singly, which is just a fancy way of saying it's like just by itself, right? The solitary flower, it's just by itself, one flower on a stalk. For example, rose. Like if you get a, a rose, it's just one rose flower on one stalk, right? But some other types of plants have what's called an inflorescence, 
which means a group of flowers. So if you look here on the right at this agapanthus, which is a type of lily as well, you can see there's one stalk. I'll use yellow. There's one stalk holding all these flowers up such that this thing here is an inflorescence. Whereas here on the rose, there's one stalk and there's just one flower that's solitary or born singly. They mean the same thing. Okay. Um, if you are a solitary flower, your stalk is called a pedicel. If you're an inflorescence with many, many flowers, your stalk is called a peduncle. And we will come across the term peduncle again, I think, for this class, I think, um, later on in another type of plant. So there's a lot of different types of inflorescences. I'm not gonna go into all of them, but it's good for you to be aware of them uh, in case you're ever walking around and you're trying to decide if you're looking at a flower um, or a group, in this case, a group of flowers, right? If you're looking at a plant and you see these flowers on it, you're kind of trying to think, what kind of plant is this? I'd like to plant this at my place. Um, these are ways you could identify what kind of plant you're looking at because you could describe how the inflorescence looks. So notice on this slide and the slides coming up, each little round circle indicates a single flower. So this is one that's called a panicle. Panicle is something that you'll find on hydrangea, for example. Then you have a spike, uh, for example, this lupine. Racing, which racing kind of looks like panicle, right? Except the difference is that on panicle, there's several flowers on each of these little stalks. Where, it, where on racing, there's only one flower on each stalk. This is called a corum. One of my students before said that this kind of, they, this reminded them of broccoli. Yeah, kind of, right? So <laughs> corum, the cool part about a corum is, I'll use red. Um, so each of these flowers of this inflorescence is on a stalk that's slightly different size, such that all the flowers are gonna be at the same level when they're grown. Like shown here in this yarrow, and what's cool about that is it provides like kind of a landing pad for pollinators, right? So if you're a bumblebee or a, a butterfly flying by, right? Ooh, you'll see this big landing pad that really is attractive to you to want to land on. And so um, hence the quorum. You have a simple which is a type of flower that you usually see in the onion family, like in this allium shown here on the right. Uh, then you have a compound umbel, which is basically an umbel of umbels. So like here, this is one umbel. You see there's a flower at each end. Kind of looks similar to a quorum, right? The regular umbel looks similar to a quorum, but notice on the umbel, on the umbel, all the stalks are the same length and they all come out of the same spot. On the quorum, all the stalks are different length and they come out at different places on the stalk, right? So not exactly the same, but same idea, kind of creates like a landing pad. Um, sometimes an umbel can be uh, almost like a round shape if there's that many flowers on it. And then an umbel, a compound umbel is just an umbel of umbel, an umbel of umbels, right? So like each of these is an umbel, this is an umbel, this is an umbel, et cetera. And then on this inflorescence, you have so many, so it's a compound umbel or an umbel of umbels, as such as this Queen Anne's lace shown here on the right, which is in the carrot parsley family. Next, we have a catkin. Catkin doesn't all look so much like a flower that you would think of. Um, these are very pop popular. These are very common in spring. Uh, so you've probably seen if you drive, you've probably seen them on your car at some point this spring. Uh, but basically they hang down. These are things that you would find, for example, in um, birch has catkins, uh, things like that. 
Ne next is inflorescence is sunflower, uh, which is an example of a head or what's called a composite flower. So sunflower is actually an inflorescence, right? So it should be called a sun inflorescence, not sunflower, sun inflorescence, because it's actually composed of two different types of, well, first of all, it's made up of many, many flowers. And on top of that, it's, an, it's made up of two types of flowers, uh, flowers that are called disc flowers, which make up the part in the middle. I'll use purple. These are all the disc flowers here. And then ray flowers, which are the, in this case, the yellow things coming off are the ray flowers of this sun inflorescence, right? <laughs> uh, here's a cross section through sunflower so that you could see the different types. Uh, but yeah, the point is it is an inflorescence because it's made of many different flowers, many flowers, and also happens to have two types of flowers. So this is a summary slide from your book to show you um, a few others that we didn't talk about. I don't, right, but um, just want you to kind of get an idea of the diversity of the different types of inflorescences. Okay. All right, monocot versus dicot flowers. We already know, we've already seen this slide, right? Like dicots have about 200,000 species and they're a very diverse group of plants with trees and shrubs and herbs, et cetera. And monocots, we've seen this slide as well. Still a lot of species, 90-ish thousand, uh, with some very familiar players, such as your grasses and orchids and palms and bananas. And so dicot seeds and monocot seeds are different. And the reason they're different is because dicot seeds have what are uh, have two cotyledons or embryonic leaves. So this is, you can think of this here as like a lima bean, right? Or a peanut or a kidney bean or black bean, right? If you've ever eaten any of those things or even a lentil, right? When you, when you, they, they fall apart, right? Like if you have a kidney bean, it will fall into like two pieces, right? Same with the peanut, right? Two pieces. Each of those pieces is this cotyledon or an embryonic leaf. So I'll use orange. So here is one cotyledon. Here is another cotyledon. So there's two cotyledons in the dicots. Um, and the word dicot helps you remember this because di means two and the cot refers to uh, you guessed it, cotyledon. So dicotyledon, dicots, two cotyledons or two embryonic leaves. Um, let's see, other parts of the seed here, you have a seed coat, which this is a, right here, this is a full bean that hasn't been split. And the thing that you're actually seeing on the outside, all this part here is the seed coat, helps protect the seed. Um, this is a little hole uh, that helps water get inside of the seed. This is where it was attached to the flower called the hilum. Um, and then just so you can see it here, this right here is our baby plant. So this is its, let me move this thing around. Uh, here is the baby plant's radical, right? It's baby root. Here's the baby plant stem. And then these leaves will actually be the first mature leaves once the seed emerges from, once the baby plant emerges from the seed. Uh, the cotyledons, right? All these, these two things here, those actually provide food to the growing baby plant. That's what their job is. So that's dicots. Mm -hmm. Monocots, mono means one, cot refers to cotyledon again. So monocots have one cotyledon. Uh, if you look here on the left, we see an onion, which is a type of monocot. And this weird looking thing here is actually the cotyledon. Um, you don't need to know that, just know that monocots have one cotyledon. Um, just to give you an example of how botany can get really complicated. Uh, in grasses, the cotyledon is called a scutellum, scutellum. 
you don't need to know scutellum for this class. Um, so goodbye, scutellum. Hello, cotyledon. So monocots have just one cotyledon. Mono, cot, one cotyledon, right? Dicots have two. All right, so that's one difference between monocot and dicot seed. Now we'll see difference in their flowers. So dicot flowers have flower parts or whorls in fours and fives and multiples of fours and fives. So for example, if you look here on the left, I'll use red. This flower here has one, two, three, four, five petals. And it probably has something like 15 stamens or something like that um, based on the picture. This flower has four petals. Well, fours and fives. So we know that these would be from dicots. But you could also have like, if it had 20 petals, right? That would still be a dicot because the multiples of fours and fives. If it had 10 petals, right? If it had eight petals, right? Two times four, two times five. So that would still be dicots. And so the flower parts would be the sepals, the petals, the stamens, and the pistil, right? Here on the right, though, you have the, that lily again. And in the monocots, they have flower parts in whorls, um, in threes, rather, and threes. So we already said, oh, red's not a good choice here. On the lily, the sepals are the same, look kind of similar to the petals, but either way, there's one, two, three petals, um, and one, two, three sepals. You might be saying, well, Rebecca, how would I, if I'm walking around and I see this slowly, how would I know that those are not just petals, right? How would I not, how would I know that they're supposed to be sepals? Well, either way, it doesn't matter because it's in threes, right? So it, if you have a flower that has six petals or nine petals uh, or 30 petals, um, it's in, you know, you're looking at your monocots there. You can also see very clearly here, this monocot has six stamens, right? So in threes, in threes, multiples of threes. Uh, we already learned this. <laughs> we already learned this in the leaf lab, right? Dicots have this net-like pattern of venation and monocots have this parallel venation in their leaves. We learned that already. And we saw this last time too, right? Not only can you see the differences in the venation from the outside with your eyes, but if you were looking at a leaf under the microscope slide, you could also see that you're looking at monocot with parallel veins or dicot with not parallel veins. We already learned this too, right? This is uh, dicot and monocot vascular arrangement in the stem. On the left there, you have the dicot with the vascular tissue arranged in a ring, right? Monocots, the vascular tissue in the stem is all scattered, not in a ring not in a ring. And you probably can guess what's coming next. <laughs> Root, right? We also saw this, um, dicot and monocot roots and how they're different as well. So remember in the dicot root, you have a single, a single vascular cylinder or vascular bundle is fine too. And the, and the xylem almost looks like an X. And in the monocot, you have a single one as well, but it kind of looks like a ring again, right? Right, so we, we also covered this last class. So this is recalls. This is another thing we mentioned last class, right? Dicots can, are usually capable of doing, of making wood, uh, meaning that they have true secondary xylem, right? They do secondary growth. Uh, and monocots rarely have that ability. Monocots tend to be more herbaceous type plants. This is nice. This is uh, from your book. This is a nice summary slide of all the differences between monocots and dicots. And I think I, I may, I don't know if I show this later, but um, the other dif another difference that I didn't show here yet is that if you're looking at the pollen grains of these plants, the monocots, 
have uh, one opening in their pollen green, whereas the dicots usually have um, three openings in their pollen greens. Okay. Oops. Okay. So I don't know if maybe some of you are not aware, of this, and that's okay. That's why we're in this class. So if you're eating a fruit, there used to be a flower there. There used to be a flower there. If you're, if you're eating an apple, that apple was at one point a flower. So here you go. Here you go. On the top here, this is an apple flower in A. These are actually two apple flowers. After the sperm and egg unite and the flower is going to basically make seeds now, the flower itself will swell and change and ultimately become the fruit. So this is showing you the progression of that in an apple, right? This is over time, but yeah. So if you're eating a fruit, that was at one point a flower. And furthermore, maybe people have, maybe you've seen discussions like this on, online or something, like is a tomato a fruit? Absolutely. <laughs> It has seeds in it. Anything that has seeds in it is botanically speaking, a fruit. So that means a squash is a fruit. A pepper is a fruit. Um, what other vegetables? Cucumber is a fruit. Um, zucchini is a fruit. If it has seeds in it, it's a fruit. And then you might say, well, ho, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on here. If a squash is a fruit and a pepper is a fruit, then what's a, what's a vegetable? A carrot is a vegetable, right? That's a root. <laughs> so a carrot is a vegetable. Lettuce is a vegetable. Um, green bean, at ah, fruit, because it has seeds in it. Uh, what else is a vegetable? Asparagus is a vegetable. Um, spinach is a vegetable. Onion is a vegetable. Those don't have seeds in them. So just so you know, yes, wow your family. <laughs> Um, so this is pictures of apple fruit coming from a flower. Here is another example with blackberry. Um, so in the in E, you see the blackberry flower. Uh, actually, in C, you see the blackberry flower as well. So this is a blackberry flower, but the sepals are still covering the flower, so you can't see all the flower parts yet. Here in D, the flower is starting to open. In E, it's all the way open and can get pollinated and the seeds can be can begin to be made. And then ultimately the parts of that flower are gonna swell up and you'll end up with a blackberry. So pictures are all well and good, but let's watch some time lapse. So hold on, I'm gonna pull them up. Uh, one second, I have to stop sharing first. And I'll pull up, hold on one second. All righty, now I will pull up. We're first we'll watch a pair and I'll say share with sound, share, and I'll make it big. So these are pear flowers starting to open. Look, those are the petals. Those little green things in the base are the sepals. Whoa, it's a little loud. Uh, those purple things are the stamens. Those are the anthers of the stamens. Look, now they're open with pollen. The green things in the middle there are the pistils. Look, now the flowers are opening. And whammo, here we'll just pause it. This thing with blue so look so so this here is a pear flower that's finished except you could still see some of the stamens all the petals have already fallen off here is also a pear flower that's finished but because you can see look here's the stamens you could even see part of the pistol still there but look underneath now swelling is occurring Swelling is occurring and that is going to grow into a pear. So if you've ever bought a fruit, right? And it has those little like 
thingies at the bit at the bottom of it that's the leftover part of the flower so look a pear guys from a flower <gasps> what <laughs> yeah i know right you didn't even know what you're eating <laughs> all right so that's pear Oh gosh, get out of here thing. All right, so pear is over. Next we will do, this is Blackberry. Make sure I'm sharing the right thing. Yeah. Okay, this is a Blackberry flower. Look, those are the stamens in there. You can see the green things in the middle are the pistils. Now the, the petals have fallen off. Pollination has occurred. And now you see things starting to swell up, right? And it's slowly turning into a blackberry, which is delicious. Look at that. Plants are amazing. Are plants amazing? Come on, come on. This is amazing. I'm sorry. Mm hmm. Man, that produce section of the grocery store is just going to be a whole new world for you guys, huh? <laughs> oh boy. All right. How long? What have we got here? Oh, okay. Here, let's. We'll go a little faster. Look. So those little red things. Those are the leftover style with the stigma of the pistol. Oh. Now it's gonna to start to turn colors. Not ah, starting to get a little reddish. That, look at that red. Look at that. Here, look. <laughs> Crazy, blackberry, pretty cool. All right, right? I know, super cool. Back to this. Okay, make it big. Great, all right, I'm sharing the right thing. I'm so petrified. Yes, share, okay. So what do we got next here? This is basic parts of a fruit, right? So if there's lots of different types of fruits. This is from your book. Um, but just to show you in this example, we're looking at a peach. Um, the seed is on the very inside of the peach. Peach only has one, one seed. Yeah, one seed in a peach. The seed is surrounded by something called the endocarp. Um, and then the mesocarp is the part that we eat, the fleshy part. And then the exocarp is the fancy word for the skin of a peach. Yep. Uh, here we go. So this is saying there's a whole bunch of different types of fruits. There are simple fruits and there's compound fruits, of course, right? <laughs> um, in the simple fruits, you have fleshy fruits and you have dry, indehiscent fruits. So in dehiscent, so you have, and then you have dry dehiscent. Dehiss means to split open. So this is saying, for example, with, with dry dehiscent means that the fruit is not fleshy, it's dry. And at a certain point in its life, it's going to split open. Whereas dry in dehiscent uh, means that it's dry, but it's never gonna split open, right? And so here's the names of some of these different types of fruits, and you can see their representative examples here on the left. I notice my study species makes the list too with its silicle. So Shepherd's Purse has a dry dehiscent fruit called a silicle, which is this guy over here. That's my Shepherd's Purse. So it's a dry fruit that eventually will split open. Uh, just to give you some examples, so an apple is an example of a fruit called a palm, 
called a palm. Um, then you have groups. Uh, here we have an almond on the left. We have olive in the middle and a peach on the right, all of which are examples of a droop. Uh, berries, so grapes are an example of berries. Oh, tomato is an example of a berry. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, then these are your simple dry indehiscent fruit. So these are dry fruits that don't uh, split. One example is nuts, right? So maybe you've seen acorns before, right? An acorn is a type of a nut and it doesn't ever split open. It just stays a hard little acorn. Samara is another dry indehiscent fruit. Samara is a type of fruit you'll see on maples, if you grew up in the New Jersey, New York area, you probably played with these as a kid, um, like by throwing them up in the air because they make little hel like helicopter things. More dry indehiscent simple fruits, we have grains on top, right? So corn is an example, and then your uh, grass. So these are all grasses, corn, wheat, and rice in that order. Uh, then there is other ones called an akeen. So the sunflower or some inflorescence, um, that sunflower seed that you get, it doesn't split open unless you make it split open, right? Um, that's an example of an akeen. Also an example of an akeen are those little dots on strawberries. So if you've ever eaten a strawberry, those little dots are the seeds. And each of those seeds is, is called an akeen. Uh, now, these are ones that are dehiscent, meaning they will split open naturally. So one example on the left here, we see a follicle in this milkweed. Then a legume, <laughs> which is all of your different peas, like a green bean is a legume. Uh, Shepherd's purse, right, with your silicle. So that's a picture of the plant and all the seed pods. On the plant, that's a close-up of one silicle, a heart-shaped silicle. And then now we have compound fruits. There's two types of compound fruits that you guys should be aware of. An aggregate fruit, for example, the blackberry that we already watched, and a multiple fruit, for example, a pineapple. So in the case of an aggregate fruit, um, Basically, I always get, right. An aggregate fruit is you have one fruit that's made up of lots and lots of ovaries, but it's all from a single flower. Whereas a multiple fruit is from an inflorescence. Uh, a fruit, a single fruit made from an inflorescence, for example, the pineapple. I don't know if you can see here. Um, so one way you can tell that, tell the difference, it's like this is one single flower. And from that single flower that has many ovaries, you'll get one single blackberry. Whereas here in the pineapple, each of these purple things is a flower. So this is an inflorescence. Each of these purple, purple things is, is a flower, but when they, ultimately they will all be responsible for making one fruit, which is the pineapple. And that's a multiple fruit. So a good way to remember it is that a multiple fruit came from multiple flowers. An aggregate fruit did not. and seed dispersal. So how do these things get around? They can't just walk, right? <laughs> they have to get around other ways. So one way is by wind. Um, one you guys are probably most familiar with are dandelions, right? So if you ever like blew the dandelion to make the fuzz fly, well, each of those little fuzzes <laughs> is holding a single seed. Um, and so those little fuzz bits help the seeds fly away further, for, far away from the parent plant. 
But that Samara that I showed you, right, the helicopter thing, that also flies via wind. Um, oh, and then this is fun. Okay, tumbleweed. So like in a tumbleweed, <laughs> in the case of a tumbleweed, the whole, <laughs> this is kind of funny, the whole plant basically dies. And, and so let's say the plant grew and it made seeds and now the seeds are on the plant, right? But we want to disperse the seeds. So in the case of a tumbleweed, the whole plant dies and rolls around. And when it rolls around, it disperses the seeds. So um, let me show you. <laughs> let me show you. Uh, so share screen. Share this. OK, we already saw that here. OK, so look at this. This is a tumbleweed. Look at that, so that's a plant that has already finished its life cycle. It's, it's presumably covered with seeds and it's just gonna roll around, <laughs> blow around in the wind. Um, and when it does that, the seeds are gonna be falling off and getting dispersed. So the seeds are not flying on the wind. The plant is flying on the wind, but, but that's also why the seeds are getting dispersed. Fun. Okay. Um, okay. Fruit and seed dispersal by animals. Yeah. So sometimes animals eat fruits and their seeds, um, or sometimes they just eat the seed. Uh, but most of the time they eat the fruit and the seeds are inside. Uh, for example, a squirrel eating a nut, like an acorn in the park, right? And this allows the seeds to get dispersed. Other times the seed actually could be covered with little stickies, like little sticky barbs, like a Velcro. I think my head may be blocking <laughs> the view for you guys. So I pull up the lecture slides on their own to see, but there's a picture of a dog here who's unfortunately been um, covered with like little sticky things like this in its fur. If you have a dog and you've ever taken it into a field in the summertime, toward the end of summer, especially, I'm sure that this has happened to you at some point, especially if your dog has long fur. Um, okay, so some, some animals, including birds, eat the seeds and then some, species of plant, they actually have to be eaten by animals um, in order, in something called scarification. So for example, some seeds that won't germinate unless they pass through the gut of an animal, in, like for example, a bird. And that's because the seed is maybe very, very tough. Maybe the seed coat is very, very thick. And so the enzymes in the gut of the animal help break down that seed coat and make it thinner or put holes in it that allow the seed that allow the seedling to emerge. That's something called scarification. Uh, and that can be due to ant passage through an animal's gut. Uh, other species actually require wildfires to do the scarification on the seeds in order for the seeds to germinate and for the baby plant to emerge. So in New Jersey, for example, in the Pine Barrens, um, there are plants there that require periodic wildfires because their seeds, some of their seeds need to be exposed to fire in order to germinate. Oops. Then some seeds and fruits are dispersed by water. So the most familiar example is probably a coconut. Another one, though, is if you've ever been in Central or uh, South America on the coast or in Florida or in some of the Caribbean islands, um, you may have seen a mangrove tree. On the top left here, these are mangrove seed uh, fruits floating through the water. There's also right there on the top right, a coconut floating through the water. Uh, and then on the bottom two pictures, we see another example of dispersal by water, which is the lotus flower, right? Like a water lily. All right, seed structure and germination. All right, so we already know, we already know that there's 
differences in monocots and dicots. And one of those differences is the number of cotyledons, right? Di, cot, two cotyledons, mono, one cot, right? Monocot, one cotyledon. Um, so this is just some other examples of that, right? This is lima bean here on the left, um, which are, would split in half as dicots, and then corn on the right. We saw this earlier. I don't know why it's here again. Okay, <laughs> weird. It, maybe that's a, I guess I was foggy when I made these, these slides. So that's a repeat of what we saw earlier. Um, either, whether you're a monocot or a dicot, eventually your baby plant will need to germinate or emerge from the seed. The baby plant can't stay inside the seed all the time, right? So this here in the middle is your baby plant. This will be the mature leaves at some point, right? Embryo, baby plant. Don't worry about the metaphyte quite yet. We'll get there later classes. Um, this is a microscope slide of this. This is a real life, <laughs> this is a real life microscope slide. This is a diagram to show you the different parts of a baby plant, right? Parts of an embryo. So you have the cotyledons, which are the embryonic leaves. Notice they have the apical meristems. You're gonna have apical meristems at both the shoot apex and the root apex, right? Because the apical meristems are responsible for what kind of growth? primary growth. And what does primary growth do? Lengthens, right? Lengthens. So you have to have primary growth at the shoot tip and the root tip because you have to lengthen, right? So we got those. Um, then we have this hypocoidal. Hypocoidal is a stem and it's the stem below the cotyledon. So like here's cotyledon, here's cotyledon, and then here is hypocoidal. Hypo means below and caudal refers to cotyledon. So it's the stem area under the cotyledon, it's hypocoidal. And then of course, embryonic root, which is right around here, um, which is the radical that we learned about in the root lab or root lecture. And then the endosperm, uh, the cotyledon ultimately becomes the endosperm they kind of are the same thing, but both of them. So yeah, it starts off as a cotyledon and ultimately becomes the endosperm. And that is the food source for the baby plant. Okay. You don't need to know all the things on this slide yet. Oh, and unfortunately I think my head is yet again blocking the part that I want you to see. So pull up those lecture slides uh, and you can see this full slide here. Um, or I could also, I guess I could also do this. I could also do this. Well, still don't really see it that great. Um, but the main thing I was trying to show you on this slide is that you end up with a seed with an embryo inside, and then eventually that embryo is going to emerge out of the seed and you'll have a new plant, right? Which is a seedling. Uh, so pull up the slides that are available on Canvas and you'll be able to see this without my head blocking it. All right, so now let's look a little bit about germination, just so we get oriented here on this slide. This here was a seed uh, that's already opened. This stuff that's kind of bumpy is the seed coat. Um, but by now the embryo is emerging. So you have the radical, right? Embryonic root, and then the hypocoidal, which is the stem below the cotyledons. The cotyledons and the top of the shoot system are still inside the seed coat in this um, microscope image. Look, root hairs are starting. So let's watch this. Stop share. And 
pull this up here. Oh. So this is this is a little bit about germination. And I think the sound will be okay, but if not, if you're wearing earbuds, maybe yes, I don't want it to be too loud. Germination. The journey of a seed to a seedling passes through many stages of growth. In the early stages, when a seed is placed in moist soil, it absorbs the water around it. The water then reaches the beginning of the baby plant or the embryo within the seed. This makes the embryo grow and increase in size. Eventually, the embryo breaks open the seed coat and comes out of the seed. The root comes out first and grows into the soil. This fixes the baby plant to the soil and helps the root absorb water and nutrients from the soil. Then the shoot comes out of the seed and starts to grow towards the sun. The first pair of leaves that come out of the seed with the shoot are called cotyledons. The root grows longer. The shoot becomes green and sprouts more leaves. This is a young plant and is called a seedling or sapling. For all these stages of germination, essential conditions or factors are required. Okay. Stop sharing that. Let me close that one. Cool. Yeah, and if if for whatever reason the um, the sound was not loud enough for you guys on that, you can pull the link off the lecture slide and watch it by yourself on YouTube. That goes for any of these links. So this is just an overview of what happens after germination, right? As the man was saying in the video, on the left here, you see the seed, seedling is starting to emerge, right? Here's the seed. The uh, radical has already become the primary root. Here's the, the uh, whoops, <laughs> stem tissue underneath the cotyledons, right? This is nice because it shows you all of the parts of the seed in one place. So this goes in this order, right? A goes to B, B goes to C, etc. Or I guess there isn't a C, but yeah, it goes in that direction. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, here are those cotyledons, which will eventually wither and fall off. Hypocoidal is the stem that's under the cotyledons. Epicoidal is the stem that's above the cotyledons. Eventually, you'll have secondary roots that branch off of the primary roots. Cool. That's for a dicot. Notice there's two cotyledons. Right? There's other ways too. You can tell that this is a dicot. Number one, there's two cotyledons. Here they're withered, one and two. Right? That's one way. But another way is look at the veins of the mature leaves. Right? Not parallel, net like. Okay. Here's our monocot. Right? Monocot, only one cotyledon. In this case, we're looking at a corn. Um, it's a little harder to see the baby plant in the corn. So like here's the top, which is the, what will be the mature leaves, uh, plumule. Here's the radical or the baby root down here. Um, but anyways, you plant the seed in the dirt and then ultimately the baby root or the radical will emerge. Uh, don't worry about coleoptile. But just know that the monocots have one cotyledon and um, but they still germinate in the same way. 
Okay. Hey. Um, so this is another video. Okay. And I'll share this video. And so that I don't distract you, I will, um, I'm gonna share this video and I'm gonna turn off my camera while we watch it. Uh, so I'll do this. Uh oh. Sorry, don't listen to them. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> okay, hold on. <laughs> One second. It's never made me watch an ad for that before. <laughs> um here where'd it go yes here we go these are really cool though because you can see all the things that we've talked about so far right Radish, not a fruit. <laughs> Radish is a root.
Writing's not that easy, but. All right. I think, I think we could probably, you could watch the rest on your own. There was one, it's making me, I can't believe how many ads that they're making us watch for this one video. Uh, let's see, what was the one that I wanted to show you guys though? Oh yeah, this one's cool. Here, hold on. Is this the one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this one you guys should try on your own. Hold on. Oops. All right, here. Stop sharing and then I'll share. Yeah, I just want to show you this last one, which is a pepper. So you can do this with your own pepper at your house. Get a pepper, take out a seed put it in some dirt. You could even put it in some just wet cotton balls if you don't have dirt around just to at least see it germinate. Eventually, if you want it to grow into a plant though, you'll have to put it in some dirt. But look, check it out. Here comes that pepper from that tiny little seed, right? From the pepper plant. Pepper is a fruit because <laughs> there's seeds in it. Um, pepper is not a vegetable. But here you go, pepper plants growing. growing, growing. And you see the way that the leaves are kind of doing this up and down thing. We'll learn about that when we talk about the plant physiology um, class. There you go, pepper flowers. Opening, petals have started to uh, wither. And look at that, peppers coming from where the flowers were. Mm -hmm. That's right, so pretty interesting. Look at that. Like I said, that walk in the produce section is going to be a different vibe for you guys now. All right, enough of that. Stop the share of that. Okay. And share this. Cool. Make it big. We're almost done here. I think that is it actually, yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely a shorter class than last time. Just so you know, there's a quiz. Uh, obviously a homework quiz is available right now on Canvas. That's due by Wednesday, but 6 p.m. And another reminder, we're gonna have a next class is plant theology. Okay, so we'll actually learn about that moving uh, next class. But then after that, the next class after that is our first exam, right? That's one week from today. And that's gonna cover everything we've covered so far plus next class, which is the plant physiology class. So to put, your, to put yourself in good shape, I would start studying now, um, reviewing your notes and getting organized for the exam. I will, uh, a study guide is going to be available. In fact, it's probably already available today. Um, so take a look there. And uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. And yep, otherwise, I will see you guys next time. Bye.